We shall be returning to that series of basic doctrines, not today, but um, certainly fairly shortly. I won't commit myself to a date, but it will be fairly soon. Plenty of doctrines yet to look at. Things like the church, and what that means, the doctrine of worship, the doctrine of prayer, the doctrine of the final judgment, and the doctrine of the eternal state. Well, there's just a, a flavour of what is yet to come in that series, and we'll be embark re-embarking upon that fairly soon. But coming to something rather different, although in a sense, of course, every time you come to the scripture, you come to a doctrine. We're being taught something, aren't we? That's what doctrine is. And what we're going to look at this morning is, is um, an answer to a question. Why we need the intercession of Jesus Christ. Why we need his prayers that are offered in heaven for his people. When we think about the intercession of Christ, we think of a verse like Hebrews 7.25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them, what we really mean by that, what the scripture means by that, is that Christ is ever before the throne of God to plead the merits of his saving work, that all that he died to win for us is applied to us and granted to us, both here in life in the world and then in the world that is to come. So we have a saviour who has died for our sins, but he ever lives to bring us the benefits that come because of that. And one of the benefits that come to us because of that is the prayerfulness of the Saviour in the face of the enmity of Satan against us. Now this is a very real matter if you think it's a sinister matter, it is a sinister matter because Satan himself is a very sinister individual. So why we need the intercession of Christ? And there are five answers to that question. And to find these answers, we're turning, of course, to Luke chapter 22. And I'll just read again verses that begin from verse 31. Luke chapter 22 and from verse 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, because thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So here is the prayer of Jesus, specifically and personally for Peter, in the face of an onslaught of Satan against not only him, but against all of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So why do we need the intercession of Christ? Well, five things spring from this passage. First of all, as I say, the enmity of Satan himself. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Now you know that the devil um, has several names given to him in the scripture. Satan is the one that we are most familiar with and the very word, both in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, and the Greek, in the New, means adversary, enemy, opponent. That's what he is. He is, first of all, the enemy of God, and he is, secondarily, the enemy of God's people, and thirdly, he is the enemy of every living soul in the world. Peter, who is figures very largely in this passage, 
would later write a letter to Christians 1 Peter, in 1 Peter and chapter 5, and you'll read this. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now when he was moved and inspired to write those words, you can be pretty sure that he would have looked back to that day when Jesus said these words to him. So he is the enemy of God, he is the enemy of Christians, he is the enemy of every living soul. And secondly, he is your or our personal enemy. Simon, Simon, the whole group of disciples we can imagine is, is, is gathered together there. But the Lord almost, as it were, looks Simon in the eye and says, Simon, Simon, this is, this is you. This is something that is happening with you. He has desired to have you. Satan's sights are set against God's people. And being the enemy of God, the enemy of Christians, the enemy of souls, he's out to get you. Actually, when it comes to people who aren't Christians, he's not out to get you, he's out to hold you and to keep you where you are, lest you come to faith in Christ. If you are one of the Lord's, then he's out to regain you, to recover you to recover his lost property, so to speak. He's your personal enemy. And his special focus when it comes to believers is to undermine faith in Christ. Now, if we're not Christians, we can be sure of this, that his main purpose is to prevent faith. You do anything to do that. Because you know, and he knows, what faith brings. It brings victory over him, it brings souls to faith in Christ, it brings them to salvation. And he will do anything to stop people from believing. But once people believe in Christ, then he will do everything within his power to undermine that faith and to bring them to fall. And the method that the Lord Jesus brings out here for that, to undermine Peter's faith, is described here at the end of verse 31. Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. So Satan's wish is to gain some influence over Simon, that he may sift him as wheat. Now what does that mean? Well, that's an allusion to what farmers do when they've gathered and harvested the wheat. And what they do is to place some of the wheat in a, in a kind of a sieve, and they shake the sieve about with a certain motion so that the chaff rises to the surface and is separated from the wheat. And then they, they sweep away that, that chaff and then they, 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 they go through a, another sort of rocking movement, movement to, to separate what remains of any chaff from, from the wheat that they want to preserve. So the chaff is the rubbish, the wheat is what they're after in terms of preserving it. And of course, so the chaff is discarded and the wheat is kept. Now, as far as Satan is concerned, what he wants to keep is the chaff, in other words, unbelief, doubts, fears, and what he wants to get rid of is the... Is the faith and confidence and desire to walk with the Lord. Now it's inverted so far as he's concerned. What is the wheat to us is faith. What is the chaff to us is the, is the, is the unbelief and the fearfulness. But so far as he is concerned, the chaff to be got rid of is faith and the wheat to be kept is unbelief and mistrust. So the, the picture here is that Satan's desire is to have influence over Simon Peter and he will rock him backwards and forwards so that he can remove faith and confidence in Christ and just have left what he considers to be the wheat, unbelief, fearfulness and so on. That's what Satan's ploy and plan is for Simon and that's very much what Satan does all the time. To get us into situations and positions where 
He can rock us backwards and forward to, to sift away the, the faith and the confidence we have in the Lord and leave behind the, the doubts and the fears that will come in its place. He will make us doubt the gospel message. He will make us fear the consequences of even coming to faith or remaining faithful unto Jesus Christ. So that's his special focus, to prevent or to undermine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the enmity of Satan. He's very strong and he's very good at what he does. He's cunning, he's powerful, he's persistent, he is very clever at deceiving and tempting. His efforts are tailor-made for every one of his targets. He knows us very accurately. Witness the state of the world. Witness the state of our own lives and the record of our lives. He is very strong and very good at what he does. And he can finally only be overcome by the intercession of Christ. Now, thankfully, if Satan knows us, Christ knows us better. If Satan hates us, Christ loves us infinitely. If Satan is strong, then Christ is stronger than he, and he is strong and mighty in his intercession and in his petitions that he makes on our behalf. So the enmity of Satan, there's the prime reason, if you like, that we need the intercession of Satan. The second reason of, of, of Christ, the second reason that we need his intercession is the weakness of our own faith. You see the prayer of Jesus here in verse 31. Uh, cite, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as weak, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. So his main focus of his prayer is that Simon's faith fails not. Faith is apt to fail in times of pressure just when we need it the most. You never notice that in ordinary life when you really need your phone to work, the batteries run down. When you really need something to work at that critical moment, it fails you somehow. And just at the very time that we need faith in Christ, our faith seems to go missing. Faith is apt to fail in times of pressure. And Jesus knows that a time of immense pressure is coming to Simon. He anticipates this here in verse 32. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted... That means to say, when thou art turned again. In other words, the Lord Jesus can see full well that in a time of pr pressure, Simon is going to turn away, and therefore Simon needs to be turned back again. And Simon's faith will prove weak. And so it was when Peter was in the, the garden, in the courtyard, being tempted, as we uh, see there later on in the chapter. Where is faith then? Where is the faith that prays to God? Where is the faith that has been taught and informed and buttressed by past experience? It was Simon Peter that said to the Lord Jesus when he saw Christ walking upon the water, bid me come unto thee. And he did, didn't he? And he walked across the water, started to walk across the water to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he began to sink. And what did he do? He immediately cried out, Lord, save me. And what did Christ do? Stretched out his hand and saved him. Where's all that gone in a time of pressure? He's forgotten everything, hasn't he? Faith has deserted him. Faith has failed in the garden. He's forgotten all these things. The, the, the faith that prays to God and finds answers to the prayers. Where is faith that believes God then will give strength and courage for the moment. Faith is apt to fail. It's not the grace of God that fails in times of pressure. It's our faith that fails. God's grace never fails. He's never insufficient. He's never neglectful of us. It's our faith in him 
that fails. Now you might think to yourself, well, Jesus' prayer wasn't answered, was it? Because when he was in the garden and under that pressure, what did he do? He did exactly what the Lord warned him against. He denied the Lord. Oh, but we'll see that this prayer was answered in a, in a most wonderful way that's an encouragement to us. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. But we need his intercession because of the weakness of our faith. The third reason we need his intercession is because of the pride of our own hearts. The pride of our own hearts. Verse 33. Simon's immediate response is, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you. There's nothing that can come against me and deter me from following you. I'm willing to do anything for you. So here's Peter. He's feeling that his faith is invincible. Nothing would ever bring him down. He could cope with anything that Satan threw at him. That's what his confidence is. Don't want to do injustice to Peter, but it's almost, it's almost as though Peter, by his response, is saying, why do you think you need to speak to me like that? Don't you realize that I've got strong faith? Don't you realize that I'm willing to do anything for you? Why do you need to address me like this? You could go even further and say, why you feel that you need to pray for me like that? You don't need to worry about me. I, I, can, I can stand against anything. I'll, I'll go anywhere for you. I'll suffer anything for you. And this is a, the kind of confidence, false confidence, that he has in himself. And maybe we think like that at times. Maybe we think that we can go through a day without praying ourselves or we can go through life without the intercession of a saviour. We can't, you know. It's an impossibility, isn't it? Do we honestly think that we can stand alone against the enemy who is stronger than us, who is ruthless and cruel and will go to any lengths to bring us down? Do we honestly think that we're a match for him? Surely experience alone tells us that we're not a match for him. Who of us can look back even over the last week and say that we have not failed the Lord? Can you say that? Can you honestly say that? Hasn't Satan in some way got the better of you? It may not be some dramatic thing, but our own personal records indicate that we are no match for the temptations that come pride, isn't it, that blinds us to Satan's guile and power. That seems to come through here with Peter. Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. You don't need to look any further than me for a fine example of a faithful disciple. Blind to Satan's guile and powers. Blind to our personal weakness. One puff of the wind and over we go. There were three puffs of wind in that courtyard, but it only took one, didn't it, to blow Peter over? Blind to our personal danger and vulnerability. After the events in Paris just the other day, that's what everybody's talking about, isn't it? How vulnerable we are. Some say that a threat is almost definite. Others say that it is possible though unlikely, who knows? Who knows? But the fact is that we are vulnerable. And it's a fool, isn't it, that thinks that we're not vulnerable. On a national scale, like the, the attacks in Paris could, could come here, they come here before, but we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable. Well, Peter's own words, he's, he's like a, a roaring lion that's prowling around, seeking whom he may devour. And it's just when we think that we're not vulnerable that we're at our most vulnerable, not on our guard against him. But we're blind to that because of our pride. And we're blind as well because of pride to our absolute need of Jesus Christ. We need him so much. 
We need him more than we realise. We need him to sustain our mortal lives in this world. We need him to give us faith to believe in the first place. We need him to maintain that faith. We need him to protect us. We need him to make us understand anything in the word. We need him to make us to believe what we read and to apply that word to our lives. We need him to to help us to imbibe this message this morning and take it to our hearts. Without him we're lost. Without his atoning work on Calvary, we're lost. Without his constant care of us, we're lost. Without his prayers, we fall to the ground without doubt. We need him altogether. You can think of things you need in your life. You need air to breathe, food to eat, warmth to keep you day by day, but you need Christ far more than that. Every waking moment, every sleeping moment, every situation that we may ever find ourselves to be in, in sorrows, in troubles, in great challenges, and in joys, and in times of great pleasure, we need him in every conceivable way. Pride blinds us to that. Fourthly, we need the intercession of Christ because we need, because of the intrinsic power of temptation. The intrinsic power of temptation. Verse 34, the Lord warns Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And from verse 54, we read just what happened. Then took they him, that's Christ, and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. Temptation. The power of temptation. Sometimes... Temptation is about rebellion. Just to do something different from what God requires of us. Very often, temptation takes the form of a pressure to take the easy way. The easy way of finding pleasure or the easy way of escaping from trouble. And here is Peter in the court courtyard afraid of what may happen to him if he's discovered to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now he's seen what's happened to the Lord, he's been arrested, he's going to be tried, the whole atmosphere and situation is a frightening thing. And to deny that he knows Christ is the easy way of escape from that. It's so at hand, isn't it? It's so easily possible. Just a few words. Just say I don't know him and then I'll be safe. Such a powerful attraction in a time like that. And it is the power of temptation that just seems to throw off all restraining influences. Peter had spent three years with Christ, maybe a little bit more than that. And all he'd knew, known of him, all he'd heard from him, all he'd seen from him, just seems to vanish when the temptation comes. Conscience seems to be quashed when temptation comes. 
Verse 61 says, the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Now what does that tell you? If it only took a turning of Christ's head to look upon Peter, and he could see him, it must have meant also that Peter could see Christ, if he'd looked. Does that mean to say, or does that suggest that, that Peter was looking the other way? He wasn't looking at Christ. He was looking away and because he didn't want his conscience, as it were, to, to disturb him. Can't look at him while I'm denying him. And conscience is just pushed away when <coughs> temptation is coming at its most powerful. Temptation seems to put flight to warnings. The warnings that Jesus had given to Peter so very precisely, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And the first person speaks. In verse 56, a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him, looked at him and thought to herself, he's a Galilean, he must have been with, with Jesus, and, and said, this man was also with him, and he denied him, saying, woman, I know him not. Didn't his mind go back to what Jesus said? You will have denied me three times? And then after a little while, verse 58, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. That's twice. Doesn't Jesus' warning come ringing back to the mind? He said three times, and I've done it twice. And about the space of one hour, you see the time for the cock crowing is coming. After this, about the space of one hour, after another, and uh, after the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. Three times. The warning had come, and the warning was forgotten in the power of temptation. Vows and promises, they get forgotten in the hour of temptation. Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. All very well at a distance, but when the, the possibility, the prospect of identification and arrest and, and trouble and even execution is all coming upon him, well, those vows and those promises are all forgotten. Have you made vows and promises to God that you conveniently forget we can all do that can't we when temptation comes against us and the power of temptation throws off the sense of the love of Christ what is so impressive about all of this is that while Peter is denying that he ever knew Christ what is Christ doing he's readying himself for the trial that's to come, the mocking, the scourging, the crucifixion, the wrath of God, and who for? Peter. Peter. Jesus is doing all of that for Peter. And this love that is in the heart of Christ for Peter, that Peter had already known for three years Christ had impressed his love upon that man. He'd seen it time and time and time again. He'd not only heard it preached and, and spoken to him and explained to him, he'd seen it. Surely every time the Saviour looked at him, there's love, there's grace, there's mercy coming from those pure, sinless eyes. And here is the Saviour going to the cross of which he had spoken so specifically. And there is Peter under pressure. And all of that love is dismissed and put away. Isn't it shameful, isn't it? But aren't we all like that? The power of temptation. The power of temptation covers over the thought of the pain of remorse that will come afterwards. 
Verse 61, the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Oh, if only we could think of that when temptation is at its peak. The bitter remorse of falling to Satan's wiles. What have I done? How could I? You can put your own words into Peter's mind and heart there because there's a sense in which all of us together, not just at one time, but frequently through the days of our lives, we have fallen to temptation and we have done things, we have said things, we've acted in such a way and afterwards it seemed like an easy thing to do at the time, it just seemed like an easy escape from pressure or trouble just seemed a natural thing to do. And afterwards, we've asked ourselves how we could have done it, how we could have fallen for it, how we could have behaved in such a dreadful manner. And we wish we hadn't. And we wish we could turn the clock back. But when the pressure of temptation is on, all of that just seems to disappear, doesn't it? The pain, the regret, the bitter tears and the sorrows, it's all forgotten because of the time of pressure and temptation. Who of us then has not fallen to such temptation? Who of us is not vulnerable to such things? The very idea of the ease of remaining in the world rather than standing for the Lord, the very idea of The comforts that can be had in the world today, that's a powerful thing. The attraction of remaining in our sins. Who can stand without the aid of Christ? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So there's the fourth reason for the need of Christ's intercession. The fifth reason is our spiritual recovery. Our spiritual recovery from falls. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Now, was Christ's thought and prayer aimed at the time of temptation in the courtyard? Well, if it was, it was a prayer not answered, or was it aimed at Peter after he had fallen that then his faith fail not? If that was the case, then his prayer most certainly was answered in a positive and glorious way. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren there's a certain statement there, isn't it? When thou art converted, when you're brought back, when you're turned again, strengthen your brethren. That's what seems to be the thrust of Christ's prayer here. Oh, thank God that in a fall like this, the worst of all falls in a way, that the forgiving grace of God is not in doubt. The blood of Christ is always and all sufficient. John wrote his first letter to his little children, to his believing congregation there, if you like. You remember what he says in chapter 1 of that letter? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's talking to Christians there. The forgiving grace of God is not in doubt. But Christ's prayer is that by faith, Fail not. In other words, thy faith in that forgiving and restoring God. That that faith doesn't fail you. In other words, that you don't think that it's all up with you, that there's no way forward, there's no way back, there's no return unto God and to usefulness. That's what Christ was really having in mind, it seems to me. See, when we're under conviction... When we have knowingly sinned against the Lord and done something that 
we know is a heinous sin in the sight of God. When we're under deep conviction of like that, when we're like Peter was in verse 62, weeping bitterly over what we've done, we may question whether we can dare to believe in God's pardon, especially if it's some repeated sin, something that's almost habitual. Can God forgive me again? Can we dare to believe in the pardon of a God after such fall? Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Don't let your faith fail in a forgiving and restoring God. We may question, under such conviction, can we dare to believe that we will be still counted as the children of God? Well, look at the words. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Thy brethren. Your Christian brethren. You're still among the brethren of Christ. You're still among the household of God. You have fallen, and sin is sin, but sin is to be forgiven through the blood of Christ, and you are still one of the brethren in the household of God. In other words, I have not disowned you. You are still one of mine. Another thing that we might be tempted to, to, to doubt or to not believe under conviction of sin is that God will ever be able to take us up and use us in his service again. What does Jesus say here? When thou art converted, and that's going to happen, Peter, because I've prayed for you, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Strengthen thy brethren. This is a commission that Christ is giving to Peter. When you've fallen and when you come back again, strengthen your brethren. I've got a work for you to do. I'm, you will be restored and you have a work to do. You may be thoroughly ashamed of yourself. You may prefer to run away and hide under a bush somewhere. But strengthen your brethren. You've got work to do. And I'm telling you and commissioning you to do that work. To strengthen the brethren would be to establish them and to help them in their Christian lives. And Peter, strangely, will be uniquely qualified to do that because of his experience of Christ. And now he will stand as one who has fallen and knows what it is to be forgiven and to be restored. And he can go to other believers who likewise will fall, who likewise will be restored by grace, and who likewise may be doubting that God could ever take them up again and use them in the, his service. But strengthen them. Be of an encouragement to them. Give them your testimony and your witness of what the Lord has done for you and how he's restored you to usefulness. Strengthen your brethren. So in other words, God does take up his people again. There is a future in the service of God. And it's one of God's wonderful overruling ways of providence, isn't it? That he takes even our sins, which are never excusable, but he takes even them and makes them to be useful in our own experience and in the furtherance of his kingdom and the help of other believers. Now, we need him, do we not? We need him. Oh, how we need him. There's a hymn, isn't there? We could have had that at the end of the service. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. And it's the truth. We need his death upon Calvary to atone for our sins. And we need that endless, glorious intercession of Christ that is in heaven. Always looking upon us, always knowing us, always seeking that God the Father would apply all of the benefits and the blessings of his atonement to us in our weakness and in our failings and in our lives altogether here in this world. Friends, don't try and live without him. Don't try and live without him. Don't go on another hour 
without trusting in Christ for your salvation. And don't go through another day without acknowledging and without, without depending upon the glorious, prayerful intercession of a great Saviour. As we trust in him, that trust will be vindicated and we shall see not only the answers to our prayers, but to his that are made for us. We thank God for such a Saviour. Amen.